Hey, everyone. Another year, another trip to Seattle in the books. Uh, Seattle is my favorite city that I've ever been to. I cherish every chance I get to visit. And better yet, my favorite convention brings me to Seattle every year, so it's it just lines up perfectly. I'm talking, of course, about PAX West. Uh, this was... Jesus, I've lost track now, like my fifth or sixth time there. Uh, there's a lot of good stuff to talk about, but first, I gotta get to the unfortunate bit, which is mainly scalpers. Uh, scalpers are the worst. They they ruin everything. You'll remember in a PAX East video, I had a good moan about them and basically set up police stings. Got a bunch of them fined. I'm not talking about people who, like, got their tickets for their friends and, and their friends bailed on them, so they're selling spares at a modest markup. Like, no, 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 I'm talking about people who have this down to such a craft that they have bots scouring, like, possi uh, possible ticket sale links so they can get in line ahead of time, basically. Uh, like, they get in a few minutes ahead before the tweet saying, hey, badges are on sale, check this link, even goes up. And they've already got, you know, four sets of four-day passes and then, uh, I don't know, a dozen more from other IP addresses. And then they sit outside the convention center preying on people who are just desperate for a pass for the day so they can enjoy this thing that they flock to the city to have fun with. Uh, and they mark up these $50 passes to like 150 160 something like that. That's... I can't even... Ugh, I can't even describe the amount of contempt that I have for these people. Uh, they make the convention-going experience worse by default. Uh, they cause massive inflation in the aftermarket sales, even from uh, people who aren't setting out to scalp, but they just have spares because they see scalpers getting 150s, so they're like, hey, why shouldn't I charge like 100 or it becomes hard to get passes from people because, hey man, the scalper over here is going to offer me 80 even though he's going to turn around and flip it for 150 So why should I just sell it for 50 or 60 And by the way, there are motherfuckers who sit literally right at the front doors hounding people coming out like, hey, you done for the day? I'll buy your badge. I'll buy your badge. Come here, man. Hey, you done for the day? That's all they do. They run that hustle all day long. And to run this back a little, uh, Passes sell out super quick. Like, we're talking Saturday badges for PAX West, the most in-demand day at the biggest PAX. They're gone in, like, a minute or less. If you aren't at your phone or on your computer on the page, the moment the PAX Twitter account sends the link out, you have a very poor chance of getting a Saturday badge. Like, you have maybe a couple of minutes to get in line, in the virtual line. Uh, I've caught the link in time for a full four day set of badges maybe two times max i normally get like friday uh friday sunday and monday saturday is a lot harder to get east is a little bit easier but i still don't always get a full three day set for east so most of the time i go to pax i i do wind up having to go and buy at the con from someone selling on the street I've usually been lucky enough to find someone selling at face value or, like, within a reasonable margin of, of face value. You know, if a ticket's 50 bucks, I absolutely do not mind paying 60 uh, if I wasn't fast enough to grab it through the official site. Like, that $10, that's, that may as well be a tip for someone doing me that courtesy. So I don't mind that. I don't mind that at all. But it gets tougher every year because of scalpers. And the other thing that you get is because scalpers buy and sell at the con, like they flip them around. Uh, they'll buy right there on the streets so they can flip them for 150 like I was saying before. The other problem is people who don't want to contribute to scalping are reluctant to sell to you because they don't know if you're just a scalper trying to flip it for a massive profit. Or if you're like a legit buyer. I'm talking... Like, these scalpers are, are dudes outside waving around a deck, like a playing card deck full of badges. Like, they could banish a motherfucker to the Shadow Realm with these things. Um, and they just have, like, knots of cash, wads of 20s and 50s. So they're, they're making a tidy killing, you know? 
huge wads of cash. And to fight back against the scalper market a bit, there are communities online. Like, you can either go with whatever normal community that you're with. Like, if you're on Gaff or something, you can check in and see if anyone else on Gaff is selling a pass. Uh, but then there are, like, more specialized communities, like the, uh, the PAX Pass Exchange subreddit, where people will sell a face value plus maybe five or ten bucks, something reasonable, and that's great. So I found a seller for Saturday on that subreddit, and I waited around, uh, like an hour and a half to meet up with them in Seattle. And then the dude just no-shows me. So that, oh, I was pissed off. Now I'm waiting through a uh, sea of these scumbag scalpers just desperately looking for any person who wants to sell a face value. Getting real pissed and dejected because I just want to go inside and enjoy packs. So finally, I see this one scalper at the front door who's been flagging people down all morning, buying their badges and flipping them. And he's just caught a dude coming out like, hey, hey, my man, you uh, are you selling your badge? And I hear the kid go, uh, yeah, yeah. And he offers this kid, the scalper offers this kid 30 bucks, $30. Like that's, oh, the greed of this dude. And I know what he's selling them for because I asked him if he was selling Saturday badges. I see a stack of Saturdays in his hand. He's like, oh yeah, 190. Like, come the fuck on, dude. You're, and you're going to have the audacity to, to try to buy this pass for 30 bucks. So I rush over. I'm like, hey, uh, if you're selling a badge, I'll pay $10 over face value, which is 60 bucks. And the scalper starts trying to outbid me. He's like, okay, I'll give you 80. So I'm pissed and I am not paying $80 or more. I'm not getting a bidding more with this, this asshole. So I turn to the kid and I tell him, look, I'm just trying to get inside and enjoy my weekend at PAX. This dude's been out here all morning flipping passes like this. He's a scalper. Um, he's going to just turn around and sell that for, you know, 150 to 190 And this dude that I'm talking to is awesome. Uh, he doesn't want to contribute to that garbage and he wants someone else to just enjoy their day. Like, he had his fun. He's out. Now he's just kind of passing that along. Great. Sells it to me for 60 bucks. Now afterwards, this scalper has the balls to get in my face and start going, yo, how are you going to disrespect me like that? And if I had been in the kind of foul mood that I was in like a minute before that interaction, I would have punched this dude in his throat. Uh, but instead, like, I'm I'm now satisfied. I'm happy. Um, I'm, I'm... I got real, real... A uh, surge of catharsis from seeing the scalper uh, get all pissy that he didn't get to flip this bass around like that. So instead, I just laughed in the dude's face, walked inside, uh, passed by a few people inside who were coming out and warned them that the dude at the front door is just a scalper <laughs> and went about my merry way. I had a good time after that. Uh, that's my big scalper story <laughs> for PAX. This time, I always seem to come away with one. Uh, luckily, everything else about the weekend was, was, thankfully, much, much better. Oh, I saw dudes pulling the CD scam and the, the beads around the wrist scam. Both of those while I was outside on the hunt for a Saturday badge. It's like, oh, I have to get this on video. Because remember, during that Yakuza recording, people were like, Huh? I've never heard of such a thing. And it's just a pair of dudes walking up to people. And man, it works out so well because they had this additional layer to it. Like the hook of it is you're relying on this this deer in headlights effect to prey on people who are awkward and non-confrontational and maybe a little bit gullible. So it's like the basic deal is they walk up, they give you a free CD, right? And then they take a photo with you. It's like, oh cool, man, this is gonna go on my album's website. Here, have this free demo or have this free CD. And then, after all that's taken care of, all, after all the, the pleasantries are out of the way, then they start hitting them up for cash. Like, as if it were a tip. Yeah, we gave you some free, maybe you should tip us. <laughs> it's so goddamn audacious. Uh, and people are like, oh, shit, I got something free, and they freeze up, and it's like, uh, uh, okay, here, here's five bucks. But these dudes outside of PAX added another layer to it. 
because they would specifically walk up to white dudes and their opening line was, oh, hey, man, thank you for not being afraid of black people. <laughs> and then they would give them the CD. So you get their attention and kind of make them freeze up like, oh, shit, if I turn my back on him now, I'm going to look racist. <laughs> I've never seen that part of it before. I've never seen that. Oh, but it's so good. Mmm, they got some people with that. Inside packs, though, <laughs> to get off of the, the outside of the convention center on the street. Shit, uh, inside packs is just the best. Like, the sights and the sounds of the booths change every year. They always go for these big, elaborate statues and setups and stuff. Just make for a photographer's paradise. Hey, hey. Like, the, the Total War booth had a big monster outside of it. The Shadow of War booth had a big dragon. Um, the Monster Hunter booth had a scale Rathalos uh, statue. Right across from... Uh, right across from that... Uh, Rathalos was a throne with Ultron Sigma from Marvel Infinite between their, uh, their Marvel setups. Just a lot of really cool stuff to see. Uh, you know, I'll save the games for the end, but it, it's just wall-to-wall -wall demos, like, big pl big publishers, uh, plus a whole section cordoned off for the, the indie mega booth, uh, free play sections for consoles, tabletop games, arcade rooms, music and dance rooms, the PAX Arena, which I spent a little bit of time at watching Injustice and Smash 4, they had a big invitational there. Uh, there was a Street Fighter V tournament. They, there was a bunch of other stuff. There are also just tournaments for like a billion different games, uh, whether that be like mobile, classic console, modern console, or even tabletop stuff or handhelds. Um, like just organized by the community in the free play sections, not like uh, big official tournaments or anything. Cosplayers all over the place. Did I mention the Steel Battalion setups again? They had the Steel Battalion uh, setups, like eight of them, plus Crash Courses all throughout the weekend. It was there again. Uh, I normally see that East. I didn't see the dude who normally runs it at East, though. They had the dope Acquisitions Inc. D&D game where they revealed a new 5th edition module called uh, Tomb of Annihilation. That's super fun. It was a big dinosaur race. <laughs> Uh, it's just everything that you could you could possibly want from a gaming convention, you will find at PAX. Plus, what I've always loved about it is how communal it is, and how you will just come away from PAX with new friends. And normally, you will make those friends in PAX's exorbitantly long lines. Uh, for instance, like the line at the Bioshock party. Uh, that was a huge fiasco that turned into kind of a miracle. They... So what they did was they asked people to RSVP ahead of time, and they had a limited number of, of virtual tickets reserved for people who RSVP'd. Uh, and this is for the 10th anniversary Bioshock party that they threw. Uh, but when people showed up at the door, they were told, Oh, hey, your RSVPs don't matter. Get in line. Well, fuck. People had been lining up for hours ahead of time, so I got there at like 7.30 thinking, Oh, I'll get there a little bit early for this 8 o'clock party. You know, it might take me 10 minutes or 15 minutes or whatever to get over there in an Uber. I don't know where this place is. And I think people had already been lining up since about 4 o'clock. So the line was wrapped around itself around the building. And most of us weren't even sure that we would be able to get in at all. But we stood there anyway and just enjoyed PAX's greatest game of all, the line game. Um, we just made the line the party. We joked, we dicked around, we got delirious, not knowing whether or not we would suddenly get turned away at some point after waiting for a couple hours. And finally, like, we actually got in and the party was okay. Like, we had more fun outside the party in the line than inside. Uh, I was thinking it'd be like this cool hard rock cafe kind of thing, except instead of rock and roll, it's all rapture themed. But it's just, like, the mood lighting is tinted blue-green a little bit. You know, you have your normal array of DJs, some cocktails renamed to be Bioshock-themed, a couple big Bioshock statues. It's It was alright, but, like, the line made waiting in line worth it, not the party itself, though. <laughs> 
Uh, this... Uh, unfortunately, this vlog isn't really gonna be too much about the rest of Seattle, because I didn't get to do all that much around town like I usually do. Uh, at least not stuff that I haven't done before. I had to cancel some plans to go down to, like, Cary Park and stuff, and, uh, the Gasworks Park. So, outside of PAX and the parties and, and just food and stuff, uh... Like, I went to Pike Place Market, I'd normally do that. I couldn't find the cheese shop with a Saganaki that I'd been recommended by, I want to say, Guy-Fi? I hung out at the waterfront during sunset before I had to go to the airport. I uh, enjoyed some good food, especially this BLT panini that was on two biscuits from this awesome local place called Biscuit Bitch. Uh, ate at another local place called Local 360. Ah, uh, what else? Everything from there was good. There's a Cheesecake Factory across from the Convention Center. I love Cheesecake Factory, so I went there a couple of times. I don't remember where this was, but I had the best blue cheeseburger that I've ever tasted. Don't even remember the name of the place. There are too many good places to eat in Seattle, especially in close proximity to downtown where the con is, so... Uh, like, for example, Pike Place Market alone is just a couple blocks down from Benaroya Hall, which is the main theater, and Benaroya is only a couple blocks away from the convention center. And all of the hotels, like, all, they're all nearby, they all host panels, it's just, it's so good. Highly, highly recommend you go to Seattle for PAX, or just go to Seattle. Just go to Seattle. Uh, now, for games, uh, I'm gonna go stream of consciousness with these. First one, Evil Within 2, uh, I loved that booth because they had a dark room that was housed inside on the convention floor. It was air conditioned. Uh, they, they had seats to sit in while you played the demo, which is actually pretty rare at PAX to be able to sit down while you're playing. When you got done playing, they had posters already inside a poster tube, which is huge because I always get posters for shit of cons and I always leave them or I give them away. Uh, because I know that that poster is gonna get trashed before I even get back to my hotel room or to a FedEx or a UPS or something to tube them up. And I know that they're not gonna survive the trip home without one, so... The demo itself, though, for the Evil Nin 2 started really strong. Um, it's, it, it's got the kind of really awesome macabre art design that I want from The Evil Within, and it tells me that yes, even if the game winds up kind of mediocre like The Evil Within was, I still get another dope art book out of this, so that alone will justify this game's existence. Uh, the second part of the demo puts you out into, the, into a city, and the city is kind of like an open world in its layout. It feels very directionless, but that's also probably because I had limited time to play around and see everything. Uh, and it was also only chapter 2, or maybe chapter 3 of the game. Uh, I will say that it feels a lot more stable, and the game feels a lot better than The Evil Within, so if that's at least improving in a couple of ways. There are no stupid black bars to make it look cinematic this time, so I have some cautiously optimistic hopes for it. There was Monster Hunter World, which all I'll say about that is that I hated Try. Uh, and I was really worried about this one, despite all of the awesome footage that I've seen. I'm not a Monster Hunter fan. Um, Try is the only one that I have any hands-on time with, or had up until now. This game is not Try. This, that alone means this has my full attention. Uh, also, just across from Monster Hunter World was something else by Capcom. I played a boatload of Marvel Infinite. Took me a little bit of time to get used to not having an assist I could call, which uh, I got used to back at EVO, and the button layout is still a little bit different, because I, I put a bunch of hours into Marvel 3, and this is more like the Marvel 2 layout, where A and B are up top and C and launch are on the bottom by default, whereas 3 used the ABC and launch on the bottom. Honestly, this game looks terrible in stills. It still looks, even in that demo, in person looked terrible when it was not in motion. It looks fine when it's in motion, and more importantly, uh, I'm a fan of how it plays, and it's really a mechanically rich game, which is which assuages a lot of the fear about it being uh, dumbed down because there are no assists, back to 2v2, all that stuff, but it's got an insane amount of potential for depth, uh, and it, it's going to have that Marvel just 
fucking insanity to it. I have no doubt about that. Uh, I wish the roster wasn't so bland, but yeah, whatever. I'm gonna run Sigma and X, so I got mine as far as the roster goes. Uh, or maybe Sigma and Jetta, because Jetta is a lot of fun. Some of his moveset reminds me of Trish's with the round trips and stuff. Uh, the, the Harvester, that? Yeah, 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 that. Uh, the other fighting game that I put some time into that weekend was DBZ Fighter Z. Uh, I think DBZ is also going to have roster problems, but that's more because Dragon Ball Z characters all fight so similarly by default. But man, it is so beautiful and so satisfying, and I don't give a fuck about DBZ, but this game is so hype and good. There's so much going on, too, because you got, like, the normal chaos of 3v3 and the assist calls and it, all that, then it's got parries, it's, it's got... Uh, the homing moves from every direction, the, the Z-Rush. So you just fly across the screen at dude from any angle. It's got an instant transmission style teleport. <laughs> so you can do stuff like, okay, I rush at you, but you parry and push block that. Uh, so I, I super to try to keep myself safe, but you teleport behind my unsafe super. So I delay hyper combo uh, to punish your teleport. There's so many layers to this. It's going to be so dope. And even the most, like, simple level of, I just want to mash out a couple of really basic combos and supers and shit. Even that's fun. I've never had fun just mashing shit out in a fighter. But, oh, this is going to be big. This is going to be really big. Plus, Android 16 is my boy. I know for sure one third of my team right now, even without the full roster, like, ideally, I would like something like 16 Tien and Brawly or 16 Tien and Janemba. Oh, if they put Janemba in, I'm going to be so happy. I don't know if OVA or movie characters or even GT characters are making it in. Don't know about that. But 16 and those power bombs, though. Ah! And that fucking explosion super. DBZ is going to be for real. That's going to bring the hype. Oh, shit. Competitive games. Uh go off that, there was a multiplayer Switch shooter called Morphe's Law, where it's a little bit like Splatoon, where it's trying to do something different with shooters, so it's not just about shoot them until their health is gone, necessarily, but in Morphe's Law, like, say you shoot someone in the head, their head gets huge, and it changes the physics of the character, or, like, you inflate a leg by shooting them in the leg, and that changes how they move and what they can do and how they behave and stuff. That was really cool. I'm looking forward to playing more of that. I also saw Battle Chasers while I was down there. Uh, I've got hands-on with that before, though, and it comes out so soon, so I didn't really play it. Uh, but I will still beg you to at least look into it. Because, man, Battle Chasers is going to be way, way up there on my Game of the Year list, I think, unless it just comes out in such a busted state. But I have some high, high hopes for that. Please look at Battle Chasers. Next to Battle Chasers, which I did not play, uh, was a game that I did not expect to be playable, which was Biomutants, the game with the Super Ninja Guts the Black Swordsman Raccoon that like just recently got announced. First off, that game has a fantastic visual imagination. Two, uh, there is some real character customization potential, maybe even long potential, with this furry raccoon creature. <laughs> uh, three, it plays real smooth. Like, it, it's clearly in an early state, and I'm already seeing a lot of potential in how free-flowing that combat is. It feels... Oh, very similar to Darksiders 2, but with different abilities and maybe a little bit more fluidity. I also managed to get in line for Mario Odyssey. I don't know why, because I already like what I've seen from it, and I knew that I was going to buy it, but I guess I just wanted to see how a normal level flowed with the, the new mechanic, with the cap. Uh, but the thing is, the worlds aren't like hubs for discrete courses like I thought they were, or it doesn't seem like that anyway. Uh, it's more like each world is a Tony Hawk level, is the best way I can think to put it. And, like, how the quests are just discovered and given out and accomplished. It feels like Tony Hawk, kind of, but in, a, in the context of Mario. 
So I'm intrigued, but it also made me a little nervous because for the 10 or 15 minutes I got to play it, I didn't actually get to do very much platforming, just exploring, which some of the ways you use the hat to get around and explore and go up buildings and, and turn into like balls of electricity and stuff, that's cool, but I, I just wanted more platforming. I just wanted that. And, ooh boy, this is going long. Uh, there's the indie mega booth. I'll kind of go rapid fire through some of these. Hot lava by clay, something I've been looking at. Uh, it's a platformer where the floor is literally hot lava. Very cool, very creative. Uh, it plays a little bit like a less frantic cluster truck. Shovel Knights, final expansion was there, uh, which is King Knights, uh, King of Cards, named so. Because in the demo, what we got were three difficulty levels. Easy, which gives you one set of levels that ends with you fighting Spectre Knight, who is greatly remixed and he fights differently. Uh, a second medium difficulty uh, set of levels that ends with you fighting King Pridemore, who is a unique boss, brand new to Shovel Knight. Fights in a huge suit of armor and the fight is fucking awesome. And... Card. Not hard. Card. Which turns everything into triple triad card battles. I suspect some people will love that, but I played the King, <laughs> I hate, I hate Triple Triad. So I played the King Pride more stuff on medium, and this feels like the most they have remixed the Shovel Knight levels that I have seen so far. Uh, it's really impressive. King Knight is unique, he's really fun, I think I like him more than Spectre Knight, and definitely more than Plague Knight. There's also this four-player game there called Dunk Lords, which is a 2v2 Monstar-style basketball game, which I had a hard time picking up right away, but it's it's just like, there are four of us sat on the couch playing this, right? And we're just howling, having a blast. So it's immediately fun, even if I didn't get my hands or my head around the controls immediately. Uh, next to that, there's a game called Way of the Passive Fist, not Pacifist, Passive Fist which is a parry-based beat-em-up inspired by Third Strike. Uh, there are different degrees of parrying, like different timings. There's a frame-perfect parry uh, versus a regular one. They award different amounts of points. I think they have different effectiveness. Uh, there's a late parry, which doesn't actually parry the hit, but it has the amount of damage that you take. Uh, and you're just parrying dudes over and over and over again until they get so exhausted you can just kind of tip them over. And then there are bosses that I talked to the developer about. They're planning on having bosses that are inspired, uh, inspired by Evo Moment 37. So it's just going to be like Chun-Li super rapid fire. You have to parry hit after, hit after hit after hit after hit after hit. Like a dozen arrow. This game sounds like this is going to be fun. What I played was really interesting. Uh, there was a PSVR horror game there called Stifled, which is an echo location based PSVR horror game. And it also uses things like the PS, uh, the PlayStation camera microphones so that like they can spook you with a jump scare and then make you yell. Like they can make you yell from being frightened and it'll pick up that yell and it will further alert things around you. They will hear you screaming <laughs> or just talking. That's going to be an L that, that's going to be the LP year's nightmare. <laughs> it's going to be the anti LP game. <laughs> and I had remember I had this idea years ago and I'm so happy someone's finally doing it to use the mic like that. Mm. I'm sure there's got to be more that I'm forgetting like oh man. UFO 50, I wanted to play that. That's the, uh, I think it's like 50 mini games from a bunch of different indie developers, including the Spelunky guys. There, there's definitely more that I'm forgetting. Uh, I think they give, they gave people who, uh, who beat the Wolfenstein demo milkshakes, but I didn't want to stand in line for that. But that's, <laughs> that's PAX in a nutshell. If you can only ever go to one convention, go to PAX West or PAX East is also pretty good. I can't speak for South or Australia. I'm sure they're in the same league, though. PAX Unplugged is coming up in November, and I'll hopefully be there for a day or two since I'm a short train ride away, and that's in, in Philly. 
But my next trip is going to be to Denver, Colorado, near the end of October for DreamHack. So if you see me there, if you're in Colorado, uh, come say hi. But until then, thanks for watching, everyone. Take it easy. Have a good one, everyone.